Welcome back to the SA Diplomats Weekly Roundup. I'm Abdurov Henslow. And today is one of those days that we unpack things that's important to you, South Africans living in South Africa and South Africans living abroad. Today we chat to Abdulaziz Davids of Kahisu Asset Management, as we always do at the end of every quarter, every financial quarter, to unpack the economic outlook for the rest of the year, the economic impacts for our people in South Africa for the last six months or the last period of 2021, and we look at the financial markets going forward. There's a lot to unpack in this video um, for you, uh, the subscriber and the viewer of SA Diplomat Abroad. The weekly roundup uh, market update is obviously brought to you by Kahiso Asset Management. They're one of our main sponsors and uh, they've been very instrumental in um, assuring society at large in South Africa and abroad that their monies are safe and managed and growing in, in South Africa. So to unpack the entire economic impacts of the last six months, the economic outlook for the next six months and where we are as an economy and what impacts and what uh, uh, difficulties our people are currently going through in South Africa financially, we chat to Abdulaziz Davids of Kahisu Asset Management. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel and pound that notification bell. Follow us also on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Pinterest and uh, obviously our YouTube channel. Visit our website also on www.sa-diplomat.com for all your news going forward. Also, don't forget to share this video with uh, those that you think might benefit from the information that's being imparted. So we get right into the interview, the quarterly economic and market update for South Africa with Abdulaziz Davids of Kahisu Asset Management. We're sitting here with Abdulaziz David of Kahisu Asset Management. And today we're going to put him in the hot seat as far as uh, the economic outlook for South Africa for the rest of 2021. We have a look at the uh, markets for the rest of the year, the markets that have been over the last six months, um, various sectors of the markets as well as the impacts that the coronavirus in South Africa has had on society at large. Abdulaziz Davids, this is a, a mouthful of topics that we, we're looking to discuss today, um, but I think we have the right man in the seat to unpack this for us. And uh, firstly, we'd like to thank Kahiso Asset Management also for the association with SA Diplomat Abroad and the Weekly Roundup. And uh, um, it's always a pleasure having you in the hot seat. You're obviously not a stranger to the hot seat uh, at SA Diplomat Abroad. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Shukran wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, yeah, as I always say, yeah, we can only do our best. Um, but this hot seat is quite comforting knowing that it's very cold here in Cape Town. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the complete opposite, uh, I can say for that, in, in Doha, we see temperatures just above 50 at the moment. Um, it's, it's basically chalk and cheese between uh, Doha and South Africa at the moment. Abdulaziz, to get straight into it, um, the last six months of 2021 has been, um, there's been some good opportunities. We've seen some good numbers come out of the markets and of our currency as well. Um, but there's also been pressures on, on our people in South Africa. As, as an introduction, can you give us a broad uh, spectrum or a broad outline of what the last six months, the first two quarters of 2021, um, 
was about and 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 uh, what it uh, has how it has impacted South Africans at large. Okay, thank you very much. I think what is quite unique about 2021 thus far is that whatever worked in the first quarter from January to March was a total disaster in the second quarter uh, from March to June. Uh, to give you a sense, uh, and just talking about the markets, I mean, in the first quarter of this year, we saw the resources sector in particular doing particularly well um, and doing about 30% in terms of returns for that first quarter. Um, so out of the market, the resources really carrying the market, um, and then a total reversal in the second quarter, where resources was the laggard in terms of market performances. Uh, in particular, in the month of June, we saw some pullback, um, you know, especially on the resources side, but also in some of the, the platinum counters as well. Uh, as you've rightly mentioned, we've seen quite a significant appreciation or strengthening of the currency, and that has also contributed to the weakness that we've seen in the resources sector. Uh, but actually offsetting that has been quite resilient performance from our industrials and financial companies uh, in South Africa. And uh, our JSE in terms of its makeup is quite unique in that we've got two very different types of markets. We've got the resources market on the one hand that benefits from a weaker currency, that benefits from commodity demand globally, and China has been the big driver of that. Uh, and then on the contra side, we've got our industrials and financial sector, which is purely South African centric and the South African GDP exposed sort of component. So what worked in the first quarter was effectively weaker currency, strong commodity demand, pushing up our resources and industrials and financials lagging. And then a total reversal in that second quarter with South Africa Inc, as we call it, really coming to the fore. The rand appreciated because you saw a lot of foreign investors into our market, uh, picking up our industrials and even some of our banking shares. Uh, but then a bit of a cooling down in terms of commodity demand, uh, quite a few of the commodity uh, prices also uh, came down quite significantly in that second quarter. And then that weighing on the resources sector. So seemingly, you know, a lot of volatility, but if one had to look at the total market performance in terms of the all share index or the Swiss index, it actually just was plain sailing. I mean, the market just carried on. But within that, the components of the market uh, clearly saw some significant divergence. Um, I wanted to just address a couple of issues that you've raised. So I think first in terms of market performances, we've seen that dynamic unfold. And uh, continuing now in the first week of July, uh, we've continued to see some uh, you know, cooling down in sentiment globally. And that continued to weigh on in terms of especially our globally exposed companies. Uh, but offsetting that, I think notwithstanding the fact that we actually in the lockdown level four in South Africa at the moment, our industrial companies and our banking shares have actually done reasonably well amidst uh, the significant pressures that we're seeing on the South African economy, which I'm sure we'll address uh, in the next couple of moments as well. Yeah, Abdul Aziz, you know, we do the market update weekly, thanks to Kakhisu as management. And uh, over the last uh, three months, we've uh, seen um, a shift from uh, in performance, um, specific uh, sectors, from resources uh, to a specific uh, emphasis on resources and resources rallying ahead to where it is now at, as the biggest losers in the top 40 and the mid cap stocks at the moment. So um, clearly, um, there is a uh, to me, as an outsider looking in, it shows that there's a, a switch in demand and there's a switch in thinking as far as investing at the moment. Uh, and you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong there. So just um, on that point, I think if, if one looks at the mining sector, I mean, as you know, going back 50 years, 100 years, South Africa ex actually came into being as a stock market because of the mining boom. You know, gold mining, uh, the, with the gold discoveries in Johannesburg uh, over 100 years ago. And for many decades, the mining sector was effectively the dominant sector uh, in South Africa. And one of the charts, in fact, the, the first chart that, uh, you know, we will show you, uh, looks actually at the South African mining uh, GDP contribution to overall GDP. And uh, from 1980, where it was at around 20%, We've seen this precipitous decline where it's gone below 10% of, of total GDP. And uh, actually, if one looks at it, uh, 2016 was the low point. We, um, I think compared to recent history, it was fairly low, around the 5 to 6% level. But uh, 
over the last 18 months, not, you know, maybe excluding the last quarter, we've seen a significant rally in terms of commodity prices uh, that we've spoken about previously uh, from the gold price that breached $2,000 uh, last year before retracing uh, to platinum and especially palladium and rhodium prices. I mean, the rhodium price has gone from something like $3,000 it briefly touched uh, $30,000 uh, earlier this year before retracing uh, to around $20,000. So, so that has led to a significant uh, increase in commodity prices and as a result, uh, revenues earned by South African mining companies. And uh, the irony is that amidst all the doom and gloom, our South African mining companies are enjoying record re levels of revenues. And as a result, they potentially are looking to, to earn record levels of profits as well. Already we've seen last year significant increases in profits coming through from the uh, South African mining companies. And that has meant that they've actually paid significant taxes as well uh, to SARS and to, to National Treasury. Um, and we expect that to continue in 2021, uh, which is quite a significant uh, contributor to the overall GDP and tax take that we will see from the government as well. Uh, I'm looking at your slide, Dr. and, and uh, um, if we look at the specifically the resource mining sector, um, uh, in uh, on, on your next slide, you, you basically show that the GDP makeup for 2020 of Africa, the mining sector making up 6.9%. Um, That's correct. Um, obviously, one of the bigger sectors, bigger sectors, not the biggest, um, in, 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 in South Africa. But uh, if we also look at it, I mean, the, uh, the, the wheel is made up of many various uh, sectors and uh, mining is only one of them. And South Africa is a complex economy and uh, there's a lot of structures that pushes everything around. Um, the one thing that, that obviously um, with our last conversation in, at the end of the last quarter, we we did we did understand that uh, resources was the one thing that was keeping the currency afloat, and the currency was strong during that that, that period when when the resource sector was running. Obviously, resources have now come down, and resources are on the back end at the moment. Is that the reason for the current uh, switch in a strong rand to a weaker rand currently? Yeah, that's a very good question because like our stock market, our currency market is also quite unique in that uh, we're almost an exclusively um, commodity exporting country and we import all our finished goods. As you know, our manufacturing sector has been decimated over the last uh, 20 to 30 years. So that means that, you know, when we see periods of significant rand weakness, it benefits anybody that exports, you know, from the mining companies to industrial companies that export uh, goods and services. Um, what it then also does is our imports become very expensive. Um, and as a result, you know, the imports start to dry, uh, drop off significantly. And uh, that then has a self-fulfilling mechanism into our currency, because effectively with uh, lower imports and with high exports, the, the miners actually, they have to buy, they, they have to sell the dollars to bring back the rands. And that and acts as a counter sort of mechanism for the currency, resulting in currency strength. <laughs> so, you know, when the rand weakens, um, they make a lot of dollars, they bring that dollars back, they have to convert it back into rands, and that leads to a, a strengthening of the currency. Similarly, on the import side, you know, when the rand is weak, imports dry off uh, and drop off significantly. And uh, because of that, there's no demand for dollars from South Africans, and that then also leads to a strengthening of the currency as well. And that self-correcting mechanism that we call it, uh, you know, has been enduring for the last probably 10 to 15 years uh, in South Africa. So, so you're absolutely right. I mean, a lot of the currency strength has been an Achilles heel for the mining sector. We've seen some pressure in terms of uh, share prices. But I think the dominant theme has actually been a cool down in commodity prices in dollar terms as well. So as I've mentioned, uh, a lot of the PGMs, for example, we've seen uh, palladium and rhodium prices coming down quite significantly uh, in that second quarter, and that has put pressure on some of the mining company uh, share prices as well. Yeah, I'm just looking at that chart of the PGMs at the moment, and uh, yes, uh, a lot so of if you look at that chart, I mean, if you look at that chart, I mean, clearly the PGMs. Notwithstanding the fact, like as you rightly said, mining only contributes about 7% of the GDP, 
what is more interesting is the delta or the change in terms of, uh, especially the tax revenues that will ensue. And in the graphic, we've highlighted 2019, 2020, and then the expectations of 2021. And you can see that there's a significant increase in terms of the potential contribution to GDP. Uh, it was about half a percent in 2019. Uh, it's more than doubled in 2020, and it's expected to more than double again uh, from 0.5% to 1.2% in 2020, and then going to about 3% of GDP uh, of 2021. So because of that change, it's actually quite a significant uh, contributor to, to tax revenues in South Africa and overall GDP growth. Remember the GDP, um, we are interested in the growth or the change in GDP. And given the significant contribution to growth that PGMs contribute, uh, that actually buoys our overall growth rate uh, as well. Abdulaziz, um, you, you know, we've seen a stronger end this year. We've also seen a weaker end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, when, when the rand weakens, um, as for the many years that I've lived in South Africa back home, um, we we shake in our boots when that rand weakens because we know that the price is going to go up and the cost of living is going to go up. So impact currently now with the in the current situation that South Africa finds itself in and as far as the economy is concerned, what are the impacts that uh, um, a low to medium income earner uh, would face currently? I, I know that there's other challenges as well that they're facing, like electricity hikes and, and so on. But, uh, we do know that um, for July, petrol has gone up, and we ex we are also expecting it to go up. And, and, and I mean, articles are, are now speaking about the oil price um, uh, starting to rise as things are becoming back to normal across the world and there's more demand for oil. So the price of oil is obviously pushing a little bit. So I think that that probably also has an, uh, an effect on the price of petrol in South Africa, which has obviously a knock-on effect to the rest of society. But what are the current uh, factors that a low to medium income earner in South Africa is facing currently? Okay, I think that's a very good question because those are the topical questions that households across South Africa are discussing at the moment. And it is topical because, um, unfortunately, July is quite a dreaded month in South Africa because all the administered prices typically go up, your municipal rates and taxes and electricity price increases. Uh, and this month in particular is quite a severe sort of impact because uh, on average, if you look at Cape Town, Johannesburg and Durban, we're looking at about a 15% increase in electricity tariffs uh, across the board uh, on average. Um, and that coupled with, as you rightly said, the increase in, in fuel prices um, will be a significant increase in terms of uh, the total expenses of a typical household. Um, and if one had to just unpack that for a second, um, as we know, a lot of our low to middle income uh, sort of households, they spend a significant amount of money on what we call administered uh, and almost fixed expenses like transport and energy. Um, so with these increases, it effectively eats into the, uh, the overall household budgets. Uh, in particular, the transport sector, now a lot of us, you know, especially in the finance and financial services environment, we've got the luxury of working from home. So our transportation costs have maybe decreased substantially uh, as a result. But a lot of, you know, the low income workers, uh, they have to show up at the factories, they have to show up uh, at the retail uh, outlets, etc. Uh, so those costs haven't gone away. And what has now happened is that um, two, two, two factors have conspired to, to a significant increase in transportation uh, related costs. The one is actually, as you rightly said, the, the increase in uh, crude oil prices, which last year, I mean, at the low, uh, the Brent price was around 15 to 20 dollars is now sitting at almost $80. Uh, so that's a significant increase over the last year. Coupled with the fact that uh, on average, most of our households, especially the low income households, they travel by taxi um, or you know these uh, mass transit sort of uh, modes of uh, public transport. Um, and given the reduced uh, volumes that a lot of these uh, transport sort of uh, platforms are experiencing, they've had to hike their prices as well, just to try and keep their revenues uh, the same. So the combination of lockdown impacting on volumes, coupled with a significant increase in crude oil prices, have led to a mass massively above inflation increases uh, in terms of transport costs as well. 
And I think that has taken a significant chunk out of households' budgets uh, as well. Um, and if I had to pin down, uh, pin it down, is effectively your transportation costs plus your electric electricity or energy costs that are significant component of household budgets and increasingly getting bigger and bigger as well as those components grow significantly above inflation. Um, I'm, I'm looking at your next slide, Abdulaziz, and, and, and it, uh, it alludes to the subdued inflation, but expected uh, to tick upwards. Yeah. So your SACPI inflation chart. And uh, to me, it looks very much like an ECG. Uh, of, yeah. And that's very much in trouble. Um, yes. So, um, you know, if you can tell the explanation of what's going on there, uh, okay. I see target bands and, and, and um, if you could just give us a rundown of that chart. Okay, so there's two elements there. Firstly, there's what is called the headline inflation, which is also looking at effectively the, the total inflation basket. Um, and that uh, effectively is, I think on your screen, it's probably a blue line. On my screen, it looks more like a green line. Uh, so that, uh, let's call it the blue line, has uh, clearly peaked in 2008, uh, and it's been coming down, you know, quite nicely over the last years. Um, and in particular, last year, with the, you know, our lockdown level five, etc., we've seen a significant drop off in demand. So typically, inflation is driven by demand. You know, people want more goods. Uh, if there's a finite amount of goods, then there's cost pressures, and you know, suppliers will push up their prices. Uh, because they can, but also to, to almost temper the demand side of the economy. And uh, as a result, we've seen a significant drop off in, uh, in inflation last year with the hard lockdown. Um, and core inflation effectively is trying to strip out all the elements that we spoke about. These administered prices, like the electricity price increases, municipal rates and taxes, etc. So that has also fallen because the other parts of that basket in terms of uh, household consumption, you know, nobody was buying big tar, uh, cars or big ticket items uh, in the hard lockdown last year. And that has also contributed to why core inflation also declined significantly. The scary statistic now is that we are in lockdown level four. Um, aside from some of the high end retailers and maybe some clothing retailers, overall demand level is still fairly subdued. Um, so compared to say 2019, demand is still subdued. But what is, what is pushing up inflation and especially the inflation expectations uh, is effectively this what they call this uh, cost push inflation. What that means is that we've got a situation where, as we discussed, all prices go up. Uh, administered uh, raw material inputs, for example, uh, uh, lump, uh, uh, lumber prices and uh, paper prices go up. That has a feed through mechanism to uh, end products that are manufactured uh, from those raw materials. So it's not demand that is pushing up inflation, it's effectively the raw material price increases that are pushing up inflation. And, uh, you know, there's a phenomenon, I don't want to ski your, your, our viewers here, but there's a phenomenon called stagflation, where effectively you've got stagnation, so because the economy is not growing and demand is, is fairly subdued, but it still increases in inflation because, you know, the underlying costs are, are going up. And that's a scary scenario to be in because uh, it's not demand, which is normally a good thing that be, uh, being robust that is driving inflation. It's actually, uh, you know, just normal input price increases that, are, that is driving inflation. And that has a knock on impact then on demand. We, because demand was already weak, you see a full, further weakening in demand. And that's that uh, stagnation component that we get. And hence you get this concept of stagflation as well. So the outlook from here, as you've rightly pointed out in terms of that slide, is for high inflation, but it's not your traditional drive of inflation, which is normally strong demand. Uh, it's more these administered price increases and raw material price increases that we're seeing that is potentially driving this. Now, as you've pointed out, I mean, there's a target band, so that's the Reserve Bank uh, sort of target range. Uh, it should be allowed between three and 6%. Um, but what they're increasingly saying is that uh, we should be closer to the three to 4% level as opposed to the 6% level. And that clearly has implications for interest rates as well. As you know, I mean, with the three and a half percent reduction in interest rates that we saw last year, uh, we are still sitting at with quite low and almost record low interest rates in South Africa. Uh, but this increase in inflation and especially the inflation expectations 
uh, will have an impact in terms of where the Reserve Bank uh, start increasing or hiking uh, interest rates as well. Abdul Aziz, I mean, uh, last year was, was obviously a unique year. Many people found themselves sitting at home uh, for lockdowns, expecting only a, a certain period of lockdown, and many many people have lost their jobs uh, due to due to the coronavirus, the dreaded coronavirus, because of pressures put on business um, around the globe. Currently, now the situation um, improved over since December to about March, April, but uh, we find ourselves once again in a situation where South Africa is in danger and decisions are taken by governments to, to obviously save us, save the people from themselves, uh, ultimately. Um, what do you see as far as the government's decision um, to impose uh, stricter, stricter restrictions on, on the people and what type of impact has that had? on the markets and, and the uh, um, uh, economy at, at large in South Africa. And going forward, I mean, uh, if I look at the situation currently, I don't think there's anything but further restrictions to be imposed by the government in order to uh, contain this uh, deadly spread that's currently going on in South Africa. Yes, um, that's our unfortunate reality at the moment is that behavior drives government actions as well. Um, and uh, we now have some experience given the hard lockdown of March last year, we, we saw a significant contraction in our GDP. I mean, if you look at those numbers, uh, the quarter on quarter contraction was over 50%. Um, I think with lockdown level four, given that it's a bit of a smarter sort of lockdown, we haven't seen that severity of some of the aspects of lockdown level five of last year. Uh, the contraction is not uh, going to be as severe. But as we know, I mean, last year with the hard lockdown, uh, we saw some government mitigation strategies in terms of making TERS payments, uh, the temporary employment relief schemes, um, and uh, those COVID payments that were, were made as well. Now, we know that the trade unions is pushing for a repeat of that uh, in this period now with our lockdown level four. But the reality is that government's ability to fund that is limited. We're already sitting with significant debt to GDP, um, you know, that is expected to roll over. But, you know, it's at very elevated levels, close to 90 percent the debt to GDP levels. Um, so the, the government's ability to, to do a lot more of those sort of TERS payments and COVID payments is fairly limited. Um, and uh, as you've rightly said, I mean, the impact on people's mobility, uh, that is a significant precursor of what the likely impact on the economy is going to be. And anecdotally, we are seeing shopping malls emptying. Uh, we are seeing fewer cars on the road, et cetera. So that will have a direct bearing in terms of the GDP numbers that we are likely to see, even for quarter two, but probably more importantly for quarter three in terms of the, the, the likely impact as well. Abdul Aziz, I mean, uh, as far as uh, the government is concerned, I mean, there, there's been a tremendous amount of debt that they entered into last year just to try and save uh, the economy and to save people's livelihoods. Um, that obviously has to be repaid, and that has to be repaid at cost. And uh, I have a feeling that, um, not I have a feeling, I mean, we, we know that uh, ultimately that's going to have to come from somewhere. Yes. And uh, as we see it, uh, um, the government hasn't imposed anything strictly uh, on, on society um, to, for the repayment of, of that debt. But what are we expecting in the future? Yeah. So if one casts our minds back to the budget of last year, I think there were two significant positive surprises. The one was that we didn't see significant tax increases. Um, and I mean, we all expected some sort of wealth tax or even a hike in VAT, given that, you know, the previous year we saw the first hike in VAT in over, in over a decade. Um, so that was certainly on the cards. But uh, I think the subtext was that government was cognizant of the weak economy and they were hoping to delay some of those tax increases to maybe 2022 to 2023. Uh, so I think what has caught everybody off guard has been the fact that we still in this pandemic. We are in lockdown level four, uh, almost now well up over a year after the initial sort of impacts. Uh, so that's the first point. The second point, which is also quite a significant positive surprise, 
has been what we've been discussing at the beginning of this program, uh, which was the increased revenues and increased taxes from the mining sector uh, because of uh, weaker currency and because of uh, strong commodity prices. Now, as we discussed, a lot of that is uh, tempering a bit. We have seen the currency strengthening. We are seeing uh, commodity prices cooling a bit. Um, so we are likely to see that same bonanza coming through from a tax revenue point of view uh, in 2022 or 2023. Um, so it leads us to the, uh, the next point, which is that something will have to be done uh, by government in terms of either uh, you know, curbing expenditure, because as we've highlighted, I mean, the, cur the, the, the COVID payments and the, the TERS payments have put a significant pressure on overall government expenditures. Uh, government is currently uh, amidst wage negotiations with the civil servants um, and, you know, their latest offer uh, is effectively for a thousand rand increase uh, plus some other benefits uh, as well. Whereas previously, uh, I mean, they took quite a hard line where they said no increases. So, so all of that has to be factored in in terms of uh, potential increases in com committed expenditures as well. So we are likely to see a scenario where if these lockdowns continue, if this pandemic continues, uh, further significant uh, pressures on government finances, uh, which makes that, um, that tax increases almost inevitable in the future. Now, in contrast, if one looks at what other countries have done, uh, Western Europe, uh, even the US, they are trying to effectively grow their way out of their debt problems. I mean, let's face it, a lot of these countries have actually more severe debt problems compared to South Africa. Whereas we, our debt to GDP is still uh, below the 100%. Many of these countries are multiples of their GDP, so well above 100% in terms of their debt levels. But the key difference is that they've got the ability to effectively grow their way out of problems by uh, having significant infrastructure spending uh, plans, by effectively funding the infrastructure spend with uh, bonds that are priced at decade, decade low interest rates. So in the US, the US 10 year treasury is sitting at 1.5% and slightly below 1.5%. So, you know, our government bond rate is significantly higher than that. So if our government was going to issue bonds to, to fund a significant infrastructure rollout, the, the additional pressure of having to service that through high interest costs will be significant compared to what the US is, for example, paying on their debt. So, so, so those are some of the, uh, the you know, scenarios that we, we, we're looking at. Um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of it is not ideal for South African sort of uh, consumer. I do think, however, and we always have to look at the silver lining. <laughs> My silver lining would be that um, government has been so uh, slow in terms of spending on infrastructure that any incremental spend uh, from current low levels will have a massive impact on overall GDP and also in employment as well. As we know, tarring of roads, big infrastructure projects are actually quite labor intensive. So you can easily create two to three million jobs by having a, a proper and well thought out infrastructure lead uh, economic plan uh, that can have a meaningful impact uh, to the overall GDP growth as well. Now, now Abdul Aziz, as far as dating is concerned, um, mm. you know, um, the one thing that, that I remember from uh, a decade ago is when the financial crisis hit South Africa. South Africa was one of those countries that managed it very well um, because they curbed uh, uh, consumer spending and they, cons uh, they curbed consumer debt um, by raising interest rates and uh, making it more difficult for people to lend money. Um, is that something that they should be looking at again from, from a government policy perspective? Um, should they be looking at curbing debt at this stage? And, and I'm not to talk about government debt. I'm thinking, talking about consumer debt at this stage, because is that not going to cause trouble in the future uh, due to uh, default repayments and, and, and so on? Yeah, that's a good point, because as you've rightly said, I mean, part of our shelter during the uh, global financial crisis of 2008 was the fact that our overall indebtedness was a lot lower compared to now. But yeah. also, if you remember back then, uh, the, we were amidst a significant infrastructure rollout because of the 2010 Soccer World Cup, where there was significant investment in infrastructure around stadiums and infrastructure as well. So you almost need a similar scenario around significant infrastructure projects to, to boost the economy. 
Um, as you've rightly said, I mean, what uh, is driving consumer debt has been the significant reduction in interest rates that we've seen last year. So that 3.5% reduction has meant that a lot of people, just by keeping the, uh, the payments the same, they've been able to borrow more uh, because your cost of, of debt has come down significantly. Um, we do have those checks and balances in place in terms of the, the, the National Credit Act, etc. But uh, that doesn't stop financial institutions from reckless lending. So, so you're absolutely right. That's something that needs to be monitored because uh, we've seen in other countries where uh, your debt bubble is effectively a, a ticking time bomb because um, you know when interest rates starts going up and you know people are over indebted, suddenly you can't afford any of your repayments anymore. And that's a, a significant risk to many countries, uh, and South Africa is not uh, excluded from that as well. Yeah, and, and uh, I think, you know, um, the, the way we look at as a, as a consumer, the way we look at interest, the way we should be looking at interest is that it's not a fixed thing. That's something that fluctuates all the time. And there's going to be times when it's very, very uh, uh, good for us as, as lenders, but there's going to be times that it's going to be very bad because it's going to be very expensive. That's right. You know, at the moment, his debt is cheap, but uh, the time is going to come where that's going to become uh, a little bit more expensive. And in the current times, I mean, it's very difficult to tell when that time might be um, because the economy is, uh, well, from an outsider looking in, the economy is very volatile uh, at the moment. Coming to that, Abdulaziz, as far as uh, we, we know, you're a portfolio manager and the head of research of Peace of Asset Management, and you, you have a, a huge responsibility on your shoulders because you manage people's money. Uh, the last six months and the last quarter must, was probably not easy uh, for you in your position to manage people's money and to add value to assets uh, that people have entrusted with you. How has that been over the last six months? I, I see the, the beards grayer than the last quarter. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely correct. Uh, I mean, yeah, with all that's been going on and all the, the, uh, yeah, uh, the issues in global markets and local markets, uh, small wonder the beard has gone grey. <laughs> but uh, I think, you know, notwithstanding that, uh, our approach has always been uh, around, you know, bottom-up valuation, but also having well-diversified portfolios. So our one-year numbers have still been very good. Uh, I mean, for the one year, our Islamic Equity Fund, which is our flagship fund, has returned over 18%. And uh, quite pleasing to note that it's continued to outperform uh, benchmarks and other Sharia funds. Um, and over other periods as well, you know, our three-year, five-year numbers are all looking very good as well. Before you go further there, uh, Islamic Equity Fund is your flagship, is uh, a Islamic uh, fund. And that fund um, has outperformed not only in, in its sector of Sharia-compliant funds. We know that it's out others as well, and you've also received awards recently yes. for that fund. Can you give us a rundown of that, please? Okay, so, um, yeah, so you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, it's been a challenging time for markets, but uh, Alhamdulillah, our fund has done exceptionally well. I mean, to, to generate the almost 19% returns for the first six months of the year, where we've seen this massive divergence, as I've mentioned, between quarter one and quarter two, and then for the one year, of, uh, you know, from 1st of July last year to 30th of, uh, 31st of May this year, that fund has returned almost 48%. Um, which is uh, quite a phenomenal performance, given that you know we saw significant pressure in markets last year. Uh, admittedly, the market turned uh, around March uh, to May last year, uh, but uh, you know if one looks at that performance, it's more than a 10% outperformance of the overall you know peer group, which is effectively over 200 other funds. And uh, as you've rightly said, I mean it's been a, uh, quite a pleasing performance, given that we've won awards. Um, uh, in, it seems like a lifetime ago, but uh, in February, March, there were the Morningstar Awards uh, and the Raging Bull Awards, and in particular, the Morningstar Fund Award for uh, you know the fund range, which encompasses our, all of our funds, the, our Sharia-compliant funds and our conventional funds, is done particularly well uh, as well. So um, I think more recently, our Kahiso Islamic Balance Fund has also won a Global Fund Award. Uh, so there's definitive, the global sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, data providers, uh, they adjust our Islamic balance fund uh, to be the overall best performing uh, global balance fund. 
uh, for three-year performance as well. Um, so I think that's quite a commendable performance, given that it was comparing our Kahis Islamic Balance Fund with global balance, uh, Sharia compliant balance funds as well. And, and and I know as well that your your, you your Islamic uh, equity uh, your Kahis Islamic equity fund has also reached a milestone um, for assets under management uh, recently. Um, uh, which, which is a clear indication that people are sitting up and uh, seeing the benefits of, of investing in the Kafis Islamic Equity Fund currently. Um, I think you hit a billion uh, rand yeah. under management. And so, uh, yes. <laughs> so, and Islamic would, Equity Fund uh, went over a billion rand. That's a thousand million rand. That's correct, a thousand million rand. So, the Islamic Equity Fund went over a billion rand. Uh, our Islamic Balance Fund was already well above a billion rand, um, and overall we're now at about four billion rand in total Sharia assets uh, as well. So, you know, from where we were, in, in fact, from 2018, uh, 2018 was the first time we've reached two billion rand in total Sharia assets. Uh, we've basically doubled from 2018 to now, from two billion to four billion uh, in total as well, yes. So clearly there's benefit in the Islamic funds at the moment because uh, um, the interest factor on the other side is not working out as well in South Africa, uh, I would presume, because interest rates are not, not that high, so there's not much interest paid out into uh, the conventional fund. So the Islamic funds are obviously, um, and I see that the, the, uh, you've also um, emphasized, there's an emphasis on investing in Sukuks uh, in the Islamic portfolios, and we see that Sukuks are also doing quite well at the moment. Um, especially living in the Middle East, we see the numbers coming out uh, monthly, and, and the Sukuk numbers are, are very good currently. Yeah. Just a word on that. I think one of the big hallmarks of uh, Sukuks and the, the, the significant benefit that Sukuks has over bonds is that if one picture it right now, right, uh, a typical US government 10 year treasury is yielding, say, 1.5%. If that rate moves to 2%, um, it is a significant capital loss that you suffer as a bondholder. Whereas the cooks don't have that capital loss element. So you effectively get your cook rate. Obviously, it's not guaranteed, but um, you know, based on history, you are likely to get your, your, your initial investment plus your cook profits as well, which gives you a very different profile compared to a bond which has significant capital loss potential uh, in a rising interest rates environment. And, and that's something that, um, I mean, ironically, we've seen significant interest from non-Muslim investors as well into a high yield fund because they're very cognizant of this dilemma where conventional bonds have almost this uh, built-in capital loss feature input uh, in a rising interest rates environment, which is totally absent from a Sukuk environment. So if you're a retiree sitting in uh, be it Doha or be it New York or be it in Johannesburg, um, it's probably advisable to switch from a, a conventional bond portfolio to a secure portfolio as interest rates rises. Uh, clearly, once interest rates have done their thing, you can then compare what the, the actual bond deals are looking like compared to, uh, to secure rates. But, you know, that, that movement from low bond, bond deals to higher bond deals does have significant capital loss potential for bond investors, which is totally absent from a secure investment as well. Abdulaziz, it's, you know, it's, it's always good having you sitting in the hot seat because no matter what questions we throw at you, there's always a, 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 a very reasonable answer and, and, and a very uh, calculated answer that, that we get back from you. And uh, I'm sure that our viewers and our listeners and our readers have all benefited from uh, what you've imparted uh, today. In conclusion, Abdulaziz, we, we are in the, we've entered the third quarter of uh, 2021. We have uh, a bit of the, well, we have three months of the third quarter left and we have four months, uh, three months of the fourth quarter left for 2021. What is expected for the rest of this year going forward? Yeah, I'll have to consult my crystal ball here. Yeah. Um, I think there, there are two scenarios that we are likely to see, um, a high road and a low road scenario. Let's start with the low road scenario. I think the low road is that uh, we see continued, uh, uh, you know, coronavirus pandemic impacts, uh, new variants coming to the fore. 
that will require people that are even people that are vaccinated to um, you know take precautions and that has significant impact uh, potentially for global econo economic activity uh, and potentially further lockdowns even in countries that have seen significant vaccine take ups as well that is a lower scenario because that will mean that we should see a bit of a not the same extent it is a severity but a bit of a repeat of what we saw uh, in the first quarter of last year um, but I think what we do know about the virus now, there's a lot more you know, knowledge, etc. Uh, so we, we are unlikely to see a, a repeat of that, but there could be further retracement similar to what we've seen in Q2 now. Um, I would put that at a 25% prob probability because I think the one thing that and the silver lining has been the significant uh, advances that we've made in medical science uh, in terms of, you know, identifying variants and then, you know, adapting and changing vaccines to accommodate a lot of those variants. Um, so, but I think that is still a scenario that one needs to consider. My higher scenario is effectively one which the World Bank still advocates, which is one of uh, you know, significant global growth led by infrastructure spending. We have seen China uh, you know, continue to spend in terms of their economy. The US uh, has passed this 2.2 trillion um, uh, infrastructure bill. So that will need to start uh, being implemented and that could buoy you know, global growth uh, you know, in the, uh, the second half of 2021. If that happens, we are likely to see further the renewed interest and demand for commodities uh, and commodity companies. And that should be quite positive for the South African economy as well. So I would put that at a more than 50%, probably around 60% uh, probability. And uh, I think that bodes well for, for the South African economy and we should see some positive spin-offs for, for, from that for the South African consumer as well, uh, in the form of uh, potentially low tax increases and potentially higher relief payments uh, as we grapple with variants and lockdowns in South Africa as well. Abdul Aziz, uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, we, we wish to uh, emphasize and, and send our best regards to everyone at Kagiso and please to stay safe. Um, South Africa, from looking from the outside in, uh, looks like a war zone currently with the amount of death um, and destruction that we're currently seeing. Our focus obviously is always to try and keep people updated and to keep people informed. This uh, specific interview was to keep people informed about what's happening in the economy and the pressures that we're currently facing. But uh, yesterday, uh, news came out um, about a new variant um, that came out of Peru that was discovered in August last year already and has been on the watch list of the World Health Organization since then, but uh, has now been discovered to be present in South Africa. And it's, uh, according to reports, um, it is a little bit more dangerous than the current Delta variant. So. Um, our advice and, and our uh, concerns for our fellow countrymen and, and, and South Africa is to please, please stay safe, to social distance, mask up, and to stay home if as much as you can and to not go out unless it's absolutely necessary. And I'm sure that yourself, Abdulaziz, Aziz, you, you would uh, endorse that message that, uh, that we put out to our, to our communities as well. But uh, from, from our side, Abdulaziz from Kahisu Asset Management, it's always a pleasure speaking to you. And I know that our, our community, our viewers, will definitely benefit from the knowledge and the expertise that you've, uh, 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 the, the, the information that you've imparted uh, today. And uh, I wish that we could be sitting there in the office doing this interview in person. But unfortunately, from our side, it's a bit difficult to travel at the moment because uh, Qatar has issued an advisory of, uh, that we shouldn't be traveling to South Africa currently. Um, but Abdulaziz, regards to the team at Kahiso Asset Management, uh, we will speak soon again. And uh, for the viewer's sake, all the information that comes out in the weekly roundup comes from this man's team in Cape Town, uh, the market updates and uh, this interview will go is, is live at on Friday uh, today, obviously at 5 p.m. the premiere. And uh, I hope that our viewers enjoyed what uh, was imparted from this side. 
please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and pound the notification bell. Until next time, we bid you. Goodbye.